कांग्रेस में हमने बात की एमनेस्टी इंटरनेशनल के जो जनरल सेक्रेटरी हैं कुमी नायडू से उनसे बात की हमने जानना चाहा कि किस तरह से जो ग्लोबल सिनेरियो है उसको वो देखते हैं जो ह्यूमन राइट्स का वॉलेशन है उसको वो देखते हैं और ख़ास तौर से कश्मीर और मोदी सरकार के बारे में उनकी क्या राय है वहाँ पर जो ह्यूमन राइट्स वॉयेशन चल रहे हैं उसे देख वह क्या कहते हैं Uh, how you see this conference first of all what's the importance you find firstly this coming together of communities across the world who suffer work and descent based discrimination is a historical event because those with power have historically thought well these people are divided in different countries they'll never be able to come together on a global basis and push for their rights at a global level and the fact that when we count the numbers we're talking about 250 million people in the world at minimum sometimes it's put as 20% or 25% of people in the world who are affected especially when we count how this plays out even in the diaspora of these communities who sometimes have to move say to the middle east for for work and and, and so on so this issue has been neglected for far too long it is a scar on the conscience of humanity that we talk about freedom democracy human rights and so on when the very countries that talk about it are engaged in mass scale discrimination of uh, communities that have suffered these discriminations for far too long and it is to the testament of these communities resilience that they are still here fighting with dignity and so on for amnesty international moving forward we are deeply committed to intensifying our work in this area we've already been working but we would ourselves say that we should be doing more we should have done more and we will commit to doing more moving forward i personally was very inspired there are people in this room who i've known for many years and i've been on the front lines in struggles with them in the anti poverty movement and so on and it was a honor for me to have this chance to listen learn and get clearer about how amnesty might be able to contribute moving forward and i will do everything uh, in my power moving forward to do that uh, two things i wanted to know from you that right now the un is also meeting the un summit is there and the sdg goals are there so why these sounds are not being uh, heard or uh, they are not being considered to that level uh, whether uh, the nation it's a, it's a problem at the uh, level of the nation or at the power of the institution that these voices which you are saying that 20 to 25 percent of the world population is so why they are not being considered well, to be important one well the way our power is actually distributed in the world is completely unfair and, and and i mean you know if you look at it economic economically 1% of the people control the wealth of this world and make the decisions right uh, when we look at a country like india you got a uh, government that historically has ignored they got nice laws and affirmative action laws and so on but they can ignore it because the way they can get away with it is they bank on the fact that if they deprive people of education if they keep people in certain forms of uh, labor and so on that people will never be able to organize because they don't have the resources don't have the education but people are from those communities have broken through that and that's why we can have this so i also i think it's very important as our colleague from brazil said we shouldn't put all our eggs in the un basket the un has not proven a reliable institution to deliver on on these because the un is a club of nation states that's what they are so if you want to get anything done you look at them in their entireties as if there are no contradictions within each of these countries so i'm not saying don't use the un system but don't have a unrealistic expectation that the un system is going to solve this problem because the un system right now is creaking you can see on every major thing the rich countries are getting away with murder with a double standard of what applies to rich countries what applies to uh, poor countries whether it's on climate whether it's in economy and so on and one thing about my country that uh, right now kashmir is under siege and there have been very less uh, move at the international level the kind of uh, violation 
Um, violation is a very small word to say what is yeah. happening in Kashmir. Yeah. So, how you see that uh, the role of the organizations like Amnesty and uh, other international organizations, uh, where the hope lies? Well, in the end, the best solution to the long standing conflict in Kashmir is for India and Pakistan to engage in meaningful dialogue and come to a meaningful solution to the problem. However, from our side as Amnesty, whether it's India or whether it's Pakistan, if they are killing people, if they are detaining people, if they are violating human rights, we're going to condemn them equally. To the Modi government, who has been suppressing India, uh, Amnesty in India, we say you can do what you want, whether it is speaking for Dalit human rights, whether it's speaking for any other human rights issue in India, or with regard to what's happening in Kashmir, we will speak notwithstanding the repression that is coming our way at the moment. Uh, you know that our office has been uh, raided by uh, government officials, they shut down the bank accounts, we had to reduce the staff and so on, but what the government of India did not calculate on is that the majority of our resources to do our work in India comes from ordinary Indian citizens. So even though they block the money coming from the outside, we've got resources to continue to fight because ordinary Indian citizens are contributing on a monthly basis to enable us to do our work. So uh, with regard to Kashmir uh, specifically, I think the people of Kashmir have suffered uh, deeply. On the you know, uh, and, and it's sad. It's it's yet another example of the failure of colonialism in the first instance, and then our uh, decolonization happened, and the failure of the international system to support. So right now, I think the best would be to put the interests of the people in Kashmir, those who live there and who have suffered there from all sides of the conflict. And I realize it's not difficult, but I do not think that the main core solution will come from outsiders. It's going to come from people who are directly in, involved in the conflict. And I hope that the leadership in Pakistan and India can find a vision and a courage to do something positive to actually reduce the conflict and to find a long-term solution. Because whatever solutions are imposed from the outside of the UN or any other body, will not be durable if both the countries don't agree. So from our side, as Amnesty, we will highlight whatever human rights violations happen by both sides of the conflict, uh, or to all sides of the conflict, which is not only the states involved. Uh, and, and in particular, while the situation exists, we make an appeal to both the governments to be as respectful as of the human rights of the people that are involved, uh, whether they're involved in you know, protest activities or not involved in protest activities. Actions such as cutting off the internet and stopping people from communicating and all in this day and age are human rights violations and we will condemn those things and bring pressure to play on those things. One last thing that how you uh, see you are mentioning about the pressure of the Modi government on the amnesty, whether the whole kind of environment is unprecedented or you have how you feel that why they are so much afraid of any kind of dissent or whether there was some opening from the government side afterwards also. Uh... It does worry me that under the current government there has been a shrinking of civic space and uh, meaning a space for civil society organizations. We know the that there have been Indian human rights activists that have been put in prison under spurious charges and so on. We see quite a, uh, you know, growing repression in terms of what civil society organizations can do. Uh, I think that the situation we find ourselves now is significantly worse than in any other time that I can remember, but I cannot make a blanket statement because I'm not, if you're asking me, is this the worst ever in India's history? I can't say that, but in my living memory that I've been an activist, uh, what I see is that things are getting worse, not getting better for the possibilities of civil society organizations to prosper. And this, by the way, didn't start now. It started when in the first months of the Modi government, when at that time I used to be the head of Greenpeace and they went after Greenpeace at that time, I'm sure it's got nothing to do with me, but <laughs> just yeah. by bad luck, I, I was there at that time. Uh, and, and what worries me more, to be honest, 
uh, is the impacts on domestic civil society organizations and the way you know FCRA was used and so on. These are all attempts of a government that does not trust its own people, that is paranoid, and it's not an expression of confidence, of faith in democracy and so on, to shrink the space for civil society. All governments, including the Indian government, must understand democracy is not simply the singular act of voting every four or five years and then government gets a blank check to do whatever it wants in the intervening years. Real democracy does include not just the representative democracy, but also the participatory democracy. And you don't have participatory democracy if ordinary people don't feel the capability to participate actively in public life through civil society organizations, whether they be NGOs, whether they be trade unions, women's movements, youth movements, uh, faith-based uh, movements, and so on. All of these should have the possibility to participate actively in yeah. public life. Thank you.